it's an honor to be here. Is, uh, um, I told uh, people back in, in Atlanta that I was going to come here to talk about uh, this project. They were uh, very, um, uh, uh, said very nice things about your school and, and, and what you're doing here. And so it's, it's an honor to be here. And um, I, I feel like um, uh, a little bit surprised maybe that you want to uh, hear about what's going on in Atlanta. Um, it is a fantastic project, but I think we have much more in the States, we have much more to learn from you about uh, transit oriented development and, and uh, the future of cities uh, for sure. And then I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, my name is Ryan Gravel. I'm an um, urban designer at a firm called Parkins and Will. We're an international design firm based mostly in North America. We have an office in London. Shanghai, Dubai. Uh, we do uh, projects just a little background. We do a lot of, um, we have a real commitment to sustainability. We're one of the leading green building uh, designers um, in the country in North America. Uh, we do work all over the world. We do all kinds of different kinds of work, architecture, mostly architecture and interiors work. Uh, we, four years ago, we started an urban design practice. We, so we have planners, um, architects, and landscape architects working together. And, design uh, discipline. Um, and we work with all kinds of different kinds of uh, projects, lots of higher education and healthcare um, work. And so our urban design uh, practices um, all over the world. This is a project in Cheddar, an uh, expansion of the Cost campus. Um, we do um, lots of uh, large scale projects like this. Um, the Belmont is a unusual um, sort of project. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit of background about Atlanta. Atlanta is a, a metropolitan region of about 5 million people, but the city of Atlanta, the urban core, um, is only about one-tenth of that population. Um, so that presents both um, sort of physical challenges and also political challenges, where the, the city doesn't have the, um, the authority to sort of um, uh, make its determinations about its future, uh, especially around the transportation. Um, it is the densest part of the region um, by far, um, but significantly overall less dense than other uh, cities in the states. Um, and you can see the, the bell line there in red. I'm talking about it in a minute, but it's really the little railroads around the downtown area. It's very close to the Samaritan city. Atlanta is a railroad town. We don't have a riverfront, a harbor. Uh, we were made by the creation of connection point of railroads crossing over the bridge, so they're very high, um, the second highest uh, city in, in America, major city in America. Um, we're uh, known for uh, the home of Coca-Cola, and also Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is from there, so there's a lot of um, uh, historical sort of um, things, and, and there's a geography of that that also overlaps uh, with the development. It is a state capital, um, but, but most of the Atlanta is known for on the right lots of highways, uh, lots of sprawl, lots of car oriented development. Um, we are part of a sort of a major um, piece of a larger uh, mega region called the Deham Atlantic mega region. It's the turquoise area here to the lower right um, that incorporates about, um, about six different states um, and other major cities. We used to build uh, Atlanta back in its original in the old days. It was a really great city to live in. You can you can ride transit anywhere you wanted. We have about 300 miles of trolleys um, like you have here. Um, we had uh, lots of walkable communities, um, but then we got rid of all of that. And what happened? The, the story of Atlanta is very similar to the story of most American cities, where we started out uh, with cities that really worked where you uh, live close to where you work, where you had multiple ways to get from your house to your work or to the store or to the park. You could walk, you could ride a bike, you could ride a transit. Um, they did accommodate the car as a car came on the line, um, but it wasn't dependent on the car. And what happened is we started to say, well, let's take the industry and let's move it out to town because we don't want the toxic chemicals next to the residential areas, which makes sense. Um, but then over time we started, we took that too far. We said, well, let's take the residential areas and move them away from everybody else altogether. 
And then the market said, let's not only do that, but let's separate the housing by what income you make. So you're really separated by people who don't live near people who are different from you. Um, and you're also separated physically so far from everything that everywhere you need to go that transit doesn't work as well, bikes don't work as well, everything is so spread out that only the car um, really works. And so everybody has to start driving. And so then everybody is driving on these new highways that we created at great cost. And, and, and over time, what we've learned by doing this over the last 60 years, that what started out sounding like it was in our best interest, it was the, it was the future that all the automobiles were going to save us from the dirty old um, city with all of its um, city uh, pollution and, and, and social problems really has created another entire set of problems and started to really diminish our quality of life, both in the urban center, which is sort of the story of America and places like Detroit especially. Um, but now what we're seeing is that there are longer term um, impacts to um, this kind of development, uh, even out of, the, out of the fringe. Um, one of the biggest ones, the most important ones, and the ones that's really starting to uh, be a part of a, a more common sort of dialogue in the states is um, public health. That this kind of growth, because you have to get in a car to go anywhere you want, because you have to get in a car literally to go to the park to find your bike, um, that all that time in the car creates a, a sedentary kind of lifestyle where people don't walk and bike, they don't get out, they don't exercise, they don't get that kind of um, uh, lifestyle that you have that's so abundant and obvious here and that we used to have. Um, and so what that has meant, you can see this just as one sort of metric, um, is the obesity rate in the United States. And we're looking at the map in 1995, where there were no states um, that had an, an obesity rate that was higher than 20%. And then this is going to be kind of scary, but um, we go to 2000, 2005, 2010, basically, and in the span of 15 years, We've gone from no states that have obesity levels um, more than 20% to all but one. And several states have an obesity rate over 30%. And when you, and when you, and I don't have them with me, but you, there are similar maps for childhood obesity. When you start talking about asthma and diabetes, childhood disease, and all the social, the physical, and, and obviously this has as much to do with what we eat as, what, as how we live. But what is very clear is that the physical environment that we live in and the infrastructure that, and that we create has had dramatically negative impacts on our public health. And so th this is documented, very well documented in um, studies by the Centers for Disease Control, um, which is our national um, public health agency. Um, and so all of this is just starting to percolate. In addition to the cost of that infrastructure that we built on these highways, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and now the maintenance costs of those highways are starting to come back to us in a way that is so clearly that we cannot afford. The, the per capita cost of maintenance on that kind of growth is so expensive relative to transit um, that we're in a pretty bad shape. And so finally, we're starting the beginning of a conversation of how you start to retrofit um, these kinds of environments. Um, to accommodate transit, both the transit back where it used to be in the old cities that are built in densities that will support it, and how you also retrofit the vast suburban areas, uh, which is a very difficult problem and long term will be an incredibly expensive problem to fix. And I know all this about public health very well because I um, spent my senior year in college at Georgia Tech abroad in Paris. I have a, uh, they have a program with the Colorado I lived in Paris and I rode the train everywhere and walked everywhere and you know, bought food at the local market. This doesn't sound radical to you at all, but for a kid from the suburban Atlanta, it was, a, it was a very different change. I was in, suddenly, within a few weeks, in the best shape of my life, I felt great. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it was clear to me at that time even that the design of how cities come together is really important. Uh, and then I went back to Atlanta, and um, Atlanta is sort of the poster child for suburban sprawl, or one of them in the states, of the Sun Belt, the southern um, mega cities and high growth, the cities that have grown a lot like Dallas and, and 
Atlanta and Phoenix, the southern part of the United States, um, are built like this. And this is what most people, many people, spend um, several hours a day. In. Um, but also, there are a lot of people who write about Atlanta. And so this is one. Uh, James Howard Kunstler, who's a New organist writer, and his conclusion, you know, it was kind of funny uh, that Atlanta's only plausible destiny is to become significantly depopulated, which is kind of funny, but not very helpful for the future, and not very, very realistic either, given that we have a, a region of five million people with, a, with an economy that powers the southeast, uh, southeastern United States. So interestingly, I was, I was a, in school, I was very much interested in, in the writing of the Blouse. And, um, and he writes also, has written also a lot about Atlanta, similarly criticizing sort of fragmented, um, splinter, sprawling sort of idea. Um, but what he, what he um, at least my interpretation of what he was writing about is much more hopeful for the future. And that is that as we start to solve the problems that we've created, it makes <coughs> us we have the opportunity to create a pretty interesting place. So the development is sort of part of that, it's part of how do you start to uh, correct the problems that we've created and how do you leverage that change to make Atlanta an interesting kind of place. Very different from cities like, um, like Rotterdam and Amsterdam and, um, and Paris, uh, but equally interesting potentially um, if we do it right. Um, so the development then was my graduate thesis um, in 1999. I did a joint degree with architecture and urban planning. Um, the idea is to take a loop of old railroads that circle a center city um, that's 35 kilometers long. Um, it's about 48 kilometers out from the center city in every direction. It does connect. We have a, um, a, a subway to line the transit route that forms across. And so those development connects to each of those uh, lines as it crosses them. Uh, so there are about 45 different neighborhoods along the way. There are about 100,000 people that live in these communities. Um, and you can see the yellow up here, these are old uh, freight railroads, so they're associated with a lot of industrial land. All, almost all of the industry has left the city. Um, they've moved out to larger sites outside of town that have better uh, access to highways for trucks. They have abandoned the railroads for shipping, so that most of these railroads are abandoned. And so the idea is not only to transfer the core of the railroad itself into a transit line, uh, but also to leverage that, that investment to, um, for the private market to come back and start to transform these industrial areas into transformative developments. Uh, the way there's about 2,000 hectares of work, uh, worth of development um, in that area. 1,500, depending on how you um, count it, some of it is you know, away from, depending on the water. Um, so this is the kind of environment that um, you can see. You can see that it's fairly close into the center city. The, the center city uh, has lots of uh, very large uh, buildings, and then there's a ring of uh, lower density neighborhoods surrounding that were built in the um, late 1800s and early 20th century. Um, the, the railroads were built in the periphery of the city when they were built, and the industry line at the moment. So you can see large, big industrial tracks along the way, and then the city. Uh, jumped across the railroad and, and continued to move on the other So there's lots of old, uh, old kind of um, industrial structures, tunnel bridges and tunnels. About two thirds of southern and western uh, sides of the Bellwinder are neighborhoods that have not seen any investment in about 70 years. They don't have grocery stores, they have lots of vacant houses, um, lots of uh, uh, poverty. Um, but most of the quarter just looks like this abandoned um, and, and some some areas that could be quite beautiful, some natural areas, um, crossing the creeks in waterways. And this is a good example of, of the sort of diagram of the project. So you've got the older railroad, which is abandoned in this case for about 30 years. Um, you've got the industrial area on both sides that, that obviously no longer uses the railroad, uh, but is also um, underutilized land, um, very fairly low density, lots of abandoned buildings. And then on either side of that are the neighborhoods with um, the houses and schools and uh, churches and uh, commercial districts that Atlanta uh, really uh, loves about itself. They're really quite nice neighborhoods. 
So just from a sense of scale, this is the land, this is the Bellhead of Berlin on the Bear Elevate land, again, surrounding the downtown and midtown area. <coughs> This would give you some scale as an overlay on Manhattan Island, so it's um, fairly large. And then this may be a little closer to home, this is the front. So you can see if, the, if, the, if we were up here on the northwestern side of the Bell Island, right here, it would be down there in the south, southeast. So I, um, I graduated from school. Um, I went to work for an architecture firm. We did a lot of master planning projects for new developments that were coming into the city. Um, I forgot to mention that um, the city, the land of the urban core, had lost about a third of our population in the 1970s and 80s. People were moving out to the suburbs. Um, but now we, um, we are growing faster than any of the suburban counties. People are moving back into the city, wanting a different lifestyle, wanting to not have to drive in all that traffic. Uh, wanting to live in a place where they at least have a chance of riding transit. Um, and so uh, there's lots of growth and development in the city. We have just now reached our um, high point. We've, we've made up that third of population that we lost in our work. Um, so there's lots of development in the city, a lot, especially on the east side and the north side. And so I was doing some of these redevelopment projects. And we were trying, in one project that I'll show you in a minute, we were trying to decide do we take a park the garage and shove it up against the old abandoned railroad, or do we orient the project toward the railroad, hoping that it would become something else one day. And I was telling my coworkers about this idea that I had in school, and they thought it was pretty cool because they live in the neighborhood, and they, um, they thought it was a great way to get to the park or get to the train station. And so, um, with their help, we, we put together some letters and maps and we mailed it out to the governor and the mayor and all the regional agencies, planning agencies, the transit authority, and um, uh, got a great response from one person who was a, on city council. She was the chair of the city council's transportation committee. And she just had a meeting talking about regional transportation projects. And what they found, the city found, remember I told you that the city is only one-tenth of the regional population. So what they found was that all the regional transportation projects were about moving people from way outside of town into downtown and back home at the end of the day, not for people who live in the city, not for people who are more likely to ride transit, more likely to want transit, more likely to pay for transit, and a large proportion of people who are dependent on transit because they can't afford a car. There's nothing absolutely for any of them. So um, literally she came back from that meeting and this letter was on her desk and she thought, wow, this is kind of cool. This is for my people and, uh, in the city. And so she called us in and we started going to neighborhood meetings in her district. And the, and the neighborhoods, the people, the public, the people of Atlanta really fell in love with the idea. Um, they thought it was a really great uh, way to, it wasn't through the middle of their neighborhood, it was at the edge of the neighborhood where they had lots of abandoned buildings and some um, crime and other problems. Um, but it connected them to their park and connected them to the train station. And then a couple of months later, uh, this councilwoman was elected city council president, which is a citywide office. So we took the conversation citywide. And we went to all these neighborhoods and all the other neighbors in the city. We literally, for three years, we went to hundreds and hundreds of meetings, every neighborhood group, every neighborhood uh, planning group, every church group, every business group, anybody and everybody that wanted to hear from us, we, we talked to. And we built, over about three years, we built this incredible groundswell of public support for the project. They got the attention of the other elected officials. They got the attention of the regional planners and um, started to build some momentum. At the same time, we got our transit authority to investigate the feasibility of it from a transit ridership perspective. And what they found was that it wasn't just some cute little idea, but it was actually moved tens of thousands of people every day. Um, and the Economic Development Agency of the city found that it would have an enormous health, um, economic development impact in the city, not only in the parts of the city that were already growing in the north and east, uh, but also in the south and west, and then we rebalanced that growth um, to other parts of the city, which was obviously a major goal uh, for the city. So that helped uh, get through the, the politics, and, and ultimately, uh, by 2005, because our state is uh, Georgia is, um, uh, they don't like to invest in transit. Um, it's very conservative and there's not a lot of money uh, spent on projects like this. Uh, we had to find our own funding source, so we created a special tax district 
Um, it's not a new tax that basically leverages the improvement, the incremental increase in tax to, um, to pay for the project itself. Um, and, that, and that was approved by the City County School Board in 2005. And so um, just within the space of uh, four and a half, five years, we went from a project on the shelf to one of the city's uh, top initiatives. Um, and so when we went around to all these people, we sold this idea on three main components. Uh, one is transportation. Um, this is not rocket science to you, but in the States, this is you know, cutting edge. Uh, that we would that we would use uh, light rail or streetcar type technology, um, very easy, much like what you see here. You can walk across the tracks, very low impact transit, but it connects you to the larger regional transit network. Um, but parallel, of course, to the transit is also the bike uh, trails. So for the 22 volt, 35 kilometers, um, also a, a bicycle loop. Um, so it connects other trails coming into the city, and for the first time ever, probably you'll be able to really uh, use bicycles in the city in a way that's uh, where you're not really taking your life in your hands. Uh, to get around. Uh, the second uh, part of this transportation, the second is economic development. Like I said, rebalancing that growth will also um, come to the south and the east and to create a kind of walking communities, uh, street level retail, the kind of life that Atlanta could have and needs to have if it's going to compete um, in a global economy. And so, and then also green space, uh, 700 acres, I'm sorry, I don't remember the translation number, um, to of existing city parks, including our major city park, major signature city park, Piedmont Park, uh, but also the zoo, um, the uh, botanical gardens, and a lot of the other cultural amenities that Martin Luther King Jr. historic district, um, all, a lot of the cultural amenities of the city are all listed, um, so that uh, looks up. <coughs> Um, so when we started, when we started that grassroots effort, that we had three main constituent groups who were advocating and wanting the project that really weren't used to being at the same table together. We had uh, community groups, community organizers, community advocates, uh, people who were looking after the, the future of their communities um, and saw development as something that would maintain their quality of life in the face of a lot of new growth and a lot of new traffic as a result of that growth. But remember. The transit system is inadequate, so people still, if they move to the city, they still have to drive, usually. And so, um, there's a way to sort of maintain quality of life in the space of that. Um, obviously, developers saw a lot of money to be made, and, and there is a lot of money to be made, and that's great, um, as long as it happens in a way that's in the community's best interest. And so, those two uh, were kind of sort of figuring that out together. And then the environmental community saw obviously the uh, regional air quality um, improvements by starting to grow differently and starting to build transit um, and all the green space and all that. So those were our three main components. But what was really fascinating is that, that when you get these three very different groups at the table all sort of wanting the same thing, a lot of other conversations start happening. So we started having um, you know uh, housing advocates talking to preservationists saying, well. The things that you're interested in uh, can also benefit the things that I'm interested in. We, can, we have some overlap and some mutually um, supportive kind of goals. And so it started a lot of conversations that really weren't happening in that time. What's even cooler about that is that that one idea that we had been um, selling, this idea of transportation, um, economic development, and um, green space, also started to become a lot of other ideas. And so the, the vision, that initial kernel of an idea, has expanded considerably uh, since the early days. And so now, in addition to the 700 acres of new parks, we're going to add 1,400 acres of additional new parks, literally taking old industrial land and transforming it into new uh, parks, including this one, which is the old quarry. It'll be the city's largest park. Um, it'll also include the, the quarry itself will be filled with drinking water, which will uh, give the city uh, 30 days of emergency drinking water if something were to happen to its water system. It currently has about uh, three days. So that's a significant improvement. Um, we don't do, uh, in states typically, we don't do housing like you do here um, in terms of protecting affordability. And so uh, the Belmont is now the largest affordable housing initiative the city's ever undertaken, uh, which is uh, a huge deal. But in addition to that, which is all about new housing units, um, it's also a community stabilization program. So if you live in one of these underserved communities and you, you're, you're seeing your property values going up and therefore your taxes going up, 
Um, there's now a set of uh, tools that you can use that will help you um, um, uh, get pay your taxes or whatever you need to do to um, not have, you don't, you're not going to force you to basically fight this for the negative side of tuition conditions. In addition to that, it's seen as a major uh, corridor for public art, um, that this is a huge amenity not only for the city residents, but also for uh, visitors to the city. Uh, they have hosted a lot of conventions. It's not the kind of place you would go on vacation necessarily, um, but um, it is the kind of place that people come to do business. And if we can get people to stay an extra day or two and enjoy the neighborhoods outside of the central city, um, I think that uh, there's a chance for that. Um, this is a railroad town. We don't have a waterfront. Um, so the preservation community sees this as a way to um, have a signature kind of public space that says something about our history. So the reuse of these railroads as a sort of railroad um, is important. Uh, we have a, a, a local uh, nonprofit organization called Trees Atlanta that is restoring, trying to restore the tree canopy that's been uh, diminished in the region. They plant trees all over the city, um, and they see the Belmont as an opportunity to create an arboretum, not only to educate people about trees, but also urban ecology, stormwater, um, invasive species, all kinds of other kind of urban ecological uh, challenges. Um, in addition to that, public health, as I mentioned, uh, we know from studies that communities that are adjacent to transit and trails are healthier because it encourages people to walk, reducing their risk of obesity related diseases like heart disease and diabetes. And so there was a public health impact assessment done in 2007 that measured what the public health um, metric work was uh, then. And then it'll be done uh, repeated periodically over the implementation of the project to measure um, what improving, uh, hopefully, improvement of public health is in the quarter. Um, sustainable design, looking at opportunities not only for the implementation of the quarter to use material and energy uh, correctly, but also uh, contribute to a larger sort of narrative about um, improving sustainable education in the city. And then this final street framework plan, which I'll get to uh, a little bit more, which is basically how do you transform what was an industrial core with large industrial tracks into something where people actually live, where they can walk, where they can get across those big tracks from the neighborhoods to the corridor, um, uh, and, and how do you create a new public ground, a new street framework in order to do that. Um, and this will illustrate that a little bit more. So this is a sort of typical uh, neighborhood in the corridor. This is in southwest Atlanta. Um, and there's my house. In case you ever heard of Atlanta, it's not bad. Um, this is the, the Beltline quarter there in red, um, so it slides along the north side of the neighborhood, and the yellow is sort of redevelopment zone of opportunity, old industrial land, and outdated, obsolete, and commercial boxes. So you can see in plan how the industrial quarter sort of slips through the city, and how the neighborhoods on either side um, sort of uh, nestle up against it. So you take that old border, you implement the, the, the main sort of infrastructure of the new border, the transit and the trail. You put stations both at major uh, thoroughfares like on the left, and also at major redevelopment sites like the one on the right. Uh, new parks where the city owns land and there's opportunities for new green space. Uh, new connecting trails and some of the railroad spurs that connect out to other parts of town would also have uh, uh, trails that connect people into the in addition to the development that's focused on the corridor, there's also the benefit of having a lot, a lot of the vacant lots and neighborhoods like this uh, fill up with new houses and new businesses. Uh, the extension of that street framework across those big industrial sites is really important, not only to create the block dimensions that are required for a lively street, um, street life, the kind of development that we've been talking about, but also to ensure that the people who live in the neighborhoods of the north, this one's called Pittsburgh, uh, can access the Bellwin to get across to it, uh, to the south. And then new parks as a part of that, and those new blocks would fill up with uh, mostly medium density kind of new development. Um, historically, the assumption was that it was highly, mostly residential with some substantial retail. In the current economic climate, there's a lot more interest now in, um, in uh, uh, employment and office than even, even some uh, Industrial that has uh, lots of jobs and uh, uh, light manufacturing, those kinds of things. But each of these blocks, just for scale, each of those are uh, like a Manhattan block in Manhattan. You could put a new fire state building on each of those blocks. That would never 
past, of course, but the future, we don't really know what the future will be. And so what we need to do is create a framework that is part of the plan that can accommodate multiple uh, features. Um, so in terms of planning, there's been a great number of different planning. This is because the public really loves this project because it's a very visible project um, in the region. Um, there's a lot of public involvement. So the initial feasibility plan was just to make sure it was going to work. Um, and then the redevelopment plan, which was the basic um, a very public process that um, assessed what the densities would be, what the overall economic impact would be, uh, where that growth would happen, how, how dense it would be in any location, where parks generally could happen. Basically, a fairly high level assessment of what the opportunity was, um, and specifically the, fees of the financial opportunity, because that's led to the funding mechanism I spoke about. Um, the sub area financial controls, I'll say a bit more in a second, is uh, sort of then take, starting with that, getting into more detail about specific areas or 10 sub areas along the route, um, specifically where are the parks going to be, where is the new development going to be, what are the density of different areas, where are the transitional areas from one, one from the dense areas down to the lower dense, lower scale neighborhoods. Um, those kinds of things are involved in the sub area plan, which is land use, um, those kinds of things. We have an overlay zoning district now in minute, which is uh, uh, an additional set of rules uh, for what you can do with your land, and it's fairly basic. It's not um, uh, it's not highly restrictive, but it basically keeps you from putting your parking garages and dumpsters and loading areas up against the public space. Um, the transit is a, another sort of challenge in, our, um, uh, in terms of how it gets implemented. It won't happen all at once. We have limited uh, transit resources in the region, so I have to think strategically how those things come together. Um, the parks, the additional uh, projects along the quarter, um, all have their own sort of design process. And then the quarter design, which I uh, have the opportunity to be working on now, as well, is the design of what the rail, how you take an old railroad and you make it into a public space and you, com and you accommodate a significantly uh, intense program, intense footprint. Um, so the subway plans are like this. This is one of the, this is the one on the west side. You can see that the projected population increase in the next uh, 30 years would be, or with the next 20 years would be a 50% increase. So for a fairly low dense residential area, so it's a uh, high uh, growth rate. And so it just looks at land use and looks at where the parks are going to should be, where the growth area is going to be. This one has a new. Uh, MARTA station, which is our transit uh, station, so the you know, heavy rail station um, that the city light rail uh, connects to. Um, and it looks at different zones, um, and it, for each of these zones, it goes into more detail about specifically where, where opportunities for development are. And this is a major increase, well, an expanded green space in existing park. Um, so each of those have, have goes through that kind of process. We're almost done, sort of going through all 10 of those. Uh, it should be done probably mid-year next year. Um, but this is a very typical kind of development that's happening. This is the one I spoke of that I was working on uh, back when we started out the idea of the post. So there's a parking garage that we're trying to decide if we jam it up against the railroad or not. Um, this is a 20-acre site that doubles the population of the neighborhood. It's not super dense, um, uh, in sort of, but it is a relative medium density. You can see the, the denser part is up against the railroad. Steps down um, toward the next. Um, and so, this is the kind of development that we're anticipating to fund uh, the tax district to pay for the project. So, literally, the development leverages development um, to pay for itself. And it does so through what we call a tax allocation district. It's a 25 year life uh, district. There's a boundary, uh, a physical area, and the, the properties in that area, um, if development is there, become more valuable, obviously. And especially when they get redeveloped, they're more valuable, so they're paying more taxes. And that incremental increase in taxes um, goes to pay for the project itself. So over 25 years, um, we expect that this district will generate $1.7 million. Um, you know, that will pay about 60% of the project cost, the remaining coming from other bonds for parks, um, uh, federal matching for transportation, um, all kinds of other things. Um, this one points the, the $2.8 billion total project cost 
um, includes everything. That's all the housing, all the parks, all the trains, and everything. Um, so you can see um, that that's where the lion's share of our, our uh, money is coming from. Um, but what was anticipated that for the taxing entities, these are property taxes, which are go through the city and county and the school board, um, for $1.7 billion invested by these entities over 25 years, at the end of that, they get a windfall of $20 billion. Um, so it's a pretty good return on that investment. Um, and it significantly increases the tax base of the city, uh, which means that in order to um, make not only development improvements, but all kinds of other improvements throughout the city. Um, so this is the kind of development that's happening already. Um, since 2005, there have been about 8,000 um, new residential units built for about 800,000 square feet of um, commercial retail. Some of that is rehabs, old industrial buildings, and some of, a lot of it is new construction. Um, and this is what it kind of looks like. There's this another new residential building, and the foreground is one of the new parks in this Fort Fort Park that just opened um, uh, earlier this year. So in addition to the corridor coming online and its pieces, there are also parks and other uh, things coming online um, <coughs> incrementally uh, sort of distributed around the entire uh, city. Um, and this is one of the major new parks in addition to being a park. It's also a stormwater facility. And um, what is directly downstream from it is this building. This is uh, 2 million square feet. It's the largest building <coughs> in the southeastern United States. It's twice as large as any of the skyscrapers downtown. It's about 10 stories tall. Um, it's an old Sears building, distribution uh, sales building. And um, it's being transformed into residential office, retail, um, lots of different things, hundreds of thousands of square feet of each of those categories. Um, it has a direct physical connection to the Beltline. Um, but historically, this property was never redeveloped because the basement flooded. And so the park is just upstream. That stormwater thing that looks like a pond in a park actually collects uh, the water and prevents this building from flooding, which allows this to uh, be redeveloped. So just last Saturday night, there was a big party and a uh, big celebration with the you know, Indigo Girls, uh, and everybody over there was supposed to uh, celebrate. Um, it was a big deal. It was a lot of fun. Um, there are a couple sections of the trail that have been built in some of the parks. This is my daughter on her first trail ride about a year and a half ago. On the north side of town. Uh, this is a new skate park. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tony Hawk. He's a famous you know, skateboarder. He contributed to this park and was there for the opening. It was a big deal for all the kids to go see that. It's the first skate park in the city. Uh, these are my kids at a new park uh, that's uh, just near, near our neighborhood um, that was significantly uh, expanded and also renovated. And this is the East Side Trail, which is the first major section of the trail to be built in the railway corridor. Um, the firm I worked for uh, designed it. It's under construction now. This was from about three weeks ago. Um, and that's about two and a half miles uh, down the east side. So it connects uh, Piedmont Park, which is a big park to the north. That's our major city park um, down past uh, the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library, Mark of the King Junior Historic District. Um, and, and connects to this other uh, trail we may be able to see going east west and goes all the way out into the eastern suburbs. Um, so, already starts to connect the trail network. So, from a design standpoint and an implementation standpoint, it's kind of challenging. So, because we don't have all the money to build it all up front, all right away, we're not only building it out ge geographically in different segments, but also within each segment, certain parts are getting built first. So, in this section, uh, the trail is getting built first. It's, it's being set up so that the transit will come later. And in this section, the transit will come probably in about three years. Uh, that will begin construction, the first section of the transit. Um, and in the rest of the corridor, uh, primarily, usually the, um, the trail will come first, will precede the transit. Um, for the corridor design, just a few images. Since you are the design school, I thought I'd share. Um, we are, Perkins and Will is the prime um, uh, design firm designing the core, what it looks like, how you get into it, where the stations are. Um, for a historic bridge, is it going to be used by transit or by trail? Um, where are the new bridges, where are the new structures, how, where are the access points, the materials, um, the plants, the ideas about tree canopies, stormwater, 
uh, transit stations, lighting, um, signage, public art, all of these things, all the stuff that it takes to build a project um, has, to, has to be designed. So we're, um, we're the lead design firm, but we're working with uh, James Moore Field Operations, who is on the Highline in New York, you may be familiar with. Um, they're a fantastic uh, firm to work for, that we work with, and so we um, are sort of going through segment by segment. And so the idea here is that uh, what's exciting about the development is a physical space, is this very uh, interesting sequence of spaces because sometimes you're high above the neighborhood surrounding you. The land is very rolling, sort of topography, hilly town. Um, so sometimes you're up above the neighborhood and sometimes you're down in the deep of the cut and you can't even see the neighborhood. Um, and so there's sometimes this broad and built in the views of the skyline, and sometimes um, it's tight between uh, old industrial buildings, very architectural. And so the idea is you have a sequence of spaces. Uh, that provide the exciting, the sort of um, uh, exciting of the core. It's played out by the landscape and the art and the lighting. And then the, the infrastructure, the, the transit stations, the trail, the railings and walls, uh, the signage, those things that um, have to, are there to sort of tie the design together. So it's recognizable as a public space from one side of town to the other, even though the physical space is quite different. And so on the east side, this is turned sideways, but we have about uh, six different these sort of character rooms um, that are sort of being, beginning to be articulated. Um, it's, it's still kind of early in the design process, but you can see that it's starting to recognize uh, what some of this might be. And then this is early rendering, it's not quite accurate, but give you a sense of uh, what the corridor uh, may look like, the variety of physical spaces and landscapes that you engage. <coughs> And then these are just some of the sort of technical uh, designs that we come up for this and for the bits and pieces that have to be designed to sort of make up the core of the trail itself is a consistent dimension and material for the entire thing. Um, it's it's uh, a medium gray concrete with a uh, exposed aggregate and the, the lighter side is always on the inner side of the loop so you can always orient yourself in the city where you are. Um, the idea of most of these pieces is to be very simple, simple, elegant, but um, understated and defer to the sort of landscape and the variety of the course. We've done some early, uh, these are just early sort of concepts for the uh, transit stations on the street scale. And, uh, and that's about it. So it's been an exciting sort of process to go from all the way from a school project. Um, I worked. Um, as a volunteer for many years as we were building a grassroots movement, we then created a nonprofit organization that um, was an advocacy group that had worked for that for a number of years. Um, I went to work at City Hall for about six months <coughs> as a planner. Um, then I worked um, for myself for a year, and then I've been at Perkins well now for about three and a half years. But to see over the course of that time go from vision to um, to actual <coughs> was pretty exciting, exciting thing. So. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you again for, for having me.